So, uh, yeah, this evening's session as uh, part of our monthly pre-hospital uh, CPD talks, uh, this evening we're looking at decision-making in pre-hospital care. And something one of my colleagues uh, that I uh, spend some time with, teach with regularly says, you know, uh, when we're talking about anything in pre-hospital care, there is no always and no never. Uh, um, the world we work in is so grey and murky that, you know, everything uh, has a place somewhere, yeah, or doesn't have a place uh, somewhere. So, you know, I think that's what definitely uh, worth exploring tonight. So as Andy said, uh, you can use the chat stuff or uh, uh, general stuff. But if you've got any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A bit because the chat bit just disappears off the top of the screen and we'll back get back to the Q&A later. But otherwise, we'll, uh, we'll make our way forwards and see where it takes us this evening. So let me take it forward a little bit. So, yeah, you know, I think what is clinical practice, I think, is, uh, is a big question to start with. Yeah. Uh, and I think, you know, whatever grade of clinician you are, as soon as you say to someone, I'm a nurse, I'm a paramedic, I'm ODP, I'm a doctor, you know, I'm a, a critical care paramedic, I'm a whatever it is you say then, you know, the first thing people will say to you is, what skills can you do? Yeah, that's a standard sort of pre-hospital question. Yeah, what skills can you do? And they're really interested in it. You know, what drugs can you give? What, uh, you know, are you allowed to intubate? You know, uh, and lots of things like that. It's how people, I think even today, that hangover from the 1970s, 1980s of how we measured pre-hospital practice and particularly paramedic practice still is a little bit ingrained in us. Uh, in how we measure people's clinical worth uh, by the things that we they do. But we know that practice is bigger than that. Yeah, um, All those skills for paramedics, which I define as, you know, sticking things in people uh, in a sort of legal manner, um, are uh, a very small part of what most paramedics do. Uh, whereas what they do do the rest of the time is use a large amount of education and knowledge uh, and experience to make hugely complex decisions about patients they know almost nothing about using fairly useless IT. Uh, and I think that's the sort of uh, true skill of the profession. So a lot of what we do is clinical reasoning and clinical decision-making uh, as opposed to skills. And I always say to some of our paramedic students, you know, if I just had to teach you the skills, if I just had to teach you the hard skills that paramedics need to know to be a registered paramedic, then uh, we could do that in about two weeks. Yeah, um, you know, um, skills are skills. You teach skills to anyone, you know, uh, and you know, you know, most of them are, are relatively straightforward. Um, what we can't teach you to do in that time is when to use the skill and when not to use the skill, when to make the appropriate clinical diagnosis, when it's appropriate to use the skill. Um, you know, that's what takes the time. And having the knowledge to do that takes even more time. So, you know, these things are all separate parts, uh, I think, but everything's driven by our clinical reasoning. Uh, and I think as you go forward, like many of you are, uh, or many of you probably plan to do in the future into advanced practice, then that gets worse because you're allowed to make more difficult decisions, um, you know, um, with less guidelines, uh, where, you know, you're making the decision based on your knowledge and experience and the evidence that's out there uh, and you have the sort of, you know, uh, authority to do that. And so this gets even more important then because, you know, there's less stuff you can refer to because it's, uh, you know, more of a, a, a open guideline-based system. You probably need to review sort of uh, guidelines and that sort of thing as well. So, you know, where did we come from, you know, back in the 1990s uh, when I joined the ambulance service? Obviously, you know, Andrew had been in the ambulance service a long time by then, but... Uh, you know, when I joined in the mid 1990s, everything was very protocol driven. Yeah, we were given a set of protocols, uh, and that protocol lasted five years. Uh, that protocol set lasted five years, and you read the protocols and you did what the protocol said for five years. There was no guidelines. Yeah, everything was black and white, uh, and you did that. And then five years later, they gave you a new set, and you read those and learned those and carried on for another five years. Yeah, there, were, there was very little autonomy uh, um, or, or um, clinical reasoning based on evidence. You just did what the guidelines said. And a protocol is, in reality, what we refer to as a recipe book. Yeah, but clinicians with a defined skill set follow precise written instructions, either recipe, like a recipe book, 
without any deviation to direct the care provided to achieve a positive potential positive outcome yeah so if you follow the same instructions you'll get an outcome that we believe to be positive and maybe a fixed outcome and we still see that in other parts of the world that have very protocol uh, driven medicine uh, without the authority really to deviate from that and the you know, they might be very complex and comprehensive protocols, but they are just that. They are protocols. Yeah, and that's uh, not something we've had for quite a few years. And you might ask, well, why not? You know, why don't we use protocols? And one of the reasons is this. You'll all recognize this. This is the uh, ALS algorithm yeah, for the UK. Uh, and what we know is that if we go to cardiac arrest and apply this algorithm religiously to all patients in cardiac arrest, we get eight to nine percent survival, yeah, um, and that's pretty, you know, pretty stable. Um, but that's obviously, you know, maybe not great, yeah. And so, you know, um, fixed protocols might give you a fixed outcome, but that outcome doesn't really change. Yeah, the protocol defines the outcome, uh, and that's a sort of a fairly, fairly set figure. So, fixed protocols get you fairly fixed outcomes. Uh, but actually, if you look at uh, the Resource Council guidelines, as I'm sure someone will point out, you know, relatively soon, the Resource Council guidelines say they are a guideline. Yeah, and uh, and they're not to be followed uh, slavishly, uh, although in practice, that's often how they're treated. Yeah, so uh, even they say, but when it's treated as a protocol, you'll get a fixed outcome. So why are we doing that? Yeah, and I think we could argue it's for the greater good, Yeah, with like a hot fuzz reference. Yeah, um, doing the best for the most is giving us that eight or nine percent survival or whatever it might be. But what's best for the individual? Yeah, we know that our patients aren't all the same. All patients in a shock and worry them aren't all the same. Yeah, so if we treat them all the same, we're just going to get a fixed outcome. Uh, and you know, we need to have a more open mind and guideline to do that. So that's where we've progressed to really in most things, isn't it? You know. Uh, I'm sure many employers would like uh, JL Calc to scribble across the front and write protocol book on it. Uh, but we know it very clearly says on the front that they're clinical guidelines um, to guide practice. And a guideline is something that maximizes positive outcomes and minimizes negative outcomes, but it's not a fixed thing. Uh, and likewise, we have the sort of nice guidelines as well, again, as the, as described, you know, but in order to operate a guideline, you generally need a higher level of education because the guideline is not black and white. The guideline is open and needs you to make decisions based around that guideline and what's better for your patient that's in front of you. Uh, and so we need that sort of capacity to do that, and that requires education. What goes into a NICE guideline? Well, this is the, uh, say the NICE guideline version. This is a good representation of you know, how a guideline is put together. Obviously, we're going to look at clinical effectiveness, the extent of uncertainty of the evidence, and that's often the case in medicine, isn't it? Now, we have some things that we have really good evidence for and some things we have absolutely no evidence for whatsoever. Yeah, and they're either done by consensus, um, you know, where we look at what seems like a good idea based on what we know, but in reality, some things we know absolutely nothing about whatsoever. So it's always got to be a practicality or, of implementation. Yeah, you know, you know, how long will it take to implement this thing? Uh, is it even physically possible to implement a standard? You know, what you know, what level of training would that require? Is it possible to get the equipment, etc.? Also, got to consider other things like values, ethics, equity, and rights to make sure we're treating everyone, you know, in the best possible way. Um, you know, and does it meet our ethical values around the outcomes we're going to get from it? It's always going to be legal and policy restraints that could be you know national law local law you know policies defined by larger organizations like the nhs that says you know this is the nhs policy on this and there's always got to be a measure of cost effectiveness you know, after, in after in any system you know regardless of what sort of financial healthcare system you're in be it a sort of uh, inclusive government funded one like ours or a for profit system there's always going to be a measure of cost uh, and determining you know is this thing you know, financially worthwhile for the, the the payback we get from it. And where does a guideline sit? Yeah, so if we look at the, sort of the general set of uh, a continuum of uh, different things that we might use, yeah, we have to look at, you know, uh, starting at the top, we've got policy. And policy is a general statement. 
yeah, policy is a, this is what we want to do, uh, you know, and, uh, and so on. Uh, below that, we have standards, so mandatory control, and our standard might say, you know, we want to do 50% of this or 100% of this. Yeah, and that's sort of guide quality uh, sometimes more than anything. Procedures may have step-by-step -step instructions. You know, any sort of clinical procedure uh, may have best practice around it, and that may not be so strictly guideline orientated because there is one well-known way to do something that is the safest way. But if you look at many clinical procedures that we use, you'll find half a dozen ways, all of which probably work as well, and no one could be ever described as being better than another way. Um, they might work better in different circumstances, so we might need to be aware of more than one way to do any procedure, uh, given that we work in such an uncontrolled and chaotic environment where you know you can't guarantee anything is going to be the same as the way you learned it. And in there we have guidelines. Yes, yeah? so guidelines are this sort of idea about recommendations, best practice, evidence, uh, and allowing us to sort of uh, have the freedom to make decisions, you know, based around all the circumstances, but taking us in the right direction. And beneath that, some sort of baseline, yeah, so, you know, a way of safeguarding implementation, a sort of a stop, a, a way that might stop, um, you know, uh, poor outcomes because of the stop point in there that means that that can't happen. This is all part of our sort of general um, setup around guidelines. Now, of course, we still have in many areas of healthcare, particularly for non-prescribers, uh, a set of protocols, and we have those in pre-hospital care for paramedics, uh, and those protocols are PGDs, patient group directives. It's a patient group directive is a legal document that gets you around prescribing legislations, but it is definitely not a guideline. A PGD is absolute. You cannot deviate from a PGD. You can't go, well, I don't like line three. You know, I want to give twice as much medication as that. If that was a guideline, you could do it, but the PGD you can't because it's a legal document that defines practice in a certain way. And that's probably in pre-hospital care, one of the only sort of true protocols we have left, something you cannot deviate from whatever the circumstances without some form of higher authority that doesn't need to utilize that patient group direction that can instruct you to do something. So our complex situations make it difficult to find bandwidth to make these complex for this complex decision making. We're going to see how much information we have coming in uh, in our sort of complex resuscitations and complex major traumas or just really complex medical patients with massively complex medical history and comorbidities and you know medications and all the other stuff you know and what interacts with what and you know they've started treating this and that's affected that and all the other things that go on in these patients so yeah i think uh you know we have to accept that we might need to have systems and practice in place to allow us to you know manage decent clinical reasoning in chaotic environments um, because otherwise we just end up drowning. And I like this picture I found it because I did note they'd brought the EPCR in, the uh, most useful piece of advanced life support equipment you can imagine. And uh, if I had my way, we'd have a system where they were chained to the ambulance where uh, for uh, Category 1 calls, it's impossible to take the EPCR with you because it definitely doesn't provide any life-saving benefits. So how do we cope with this stream of information coming our way, particularly as the lead clinician at a complex multi-agency scene particularly? You know, if we've got fire and police there and other agencies, uh, you know, and we're trying to manage something that's really complex, that may be something we don't do very often. Yeah, there's a lot of people telling us a lot of stuff. You know, a lot of it's superfluous. You know, how do we cope with that volume of information i think that's quite a good analogy where people describe it as trying to drink from a fire hose yeah you just get drowned in information to the point you're just choking on it and you you can't make any use of the water because there's just too much of it and i think that's really important we recognize that sometimes that you know a sea of information can be the most difficult thing we face sometimes too much information can be harder to deal with than not enough so I looked around with some models. There's lots of models, isn't there, around clinical reasoning and clinical decision-making. So I looked around for something that, to me, made sense. I hope it makes sense to you, and I found this. And I thought it was a really good model, uh, a really good diagram presenting all the things that are involved in our clinical reasoning and how they interact with each other. 
And I think it was, we're definitely worth working our way through this to see how it, how we make clinical decisions in pre-hospital care, you know, in this chaotic in, uh, environment with little information about the patient. You know, we've not met them before. We don't have their notes as a whole, you know, unless you can spy match them and find out some bizarre information around them that's probably out of date. So, you know, how can we learn from this sort of model? So firstly, our sort of clinical skills, you know, our history and physical examination of the patient. So the information we gather directly from the patient. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, uh, usually our sort of starting point, isn't it? We take some history about what's happened and we're examining the patient, be that through a medical model or through a sort of didactic primary survey that we might see in a trauma patient and gathering information directly from the scene and the patient. And that sounds like a really good thing. One of the trouble is that, you know, sometimes that may not be complete, you know, and sometimes we don't know whether it's true. Yeah, now either we don't have much information or the patient isn't telling us the right information, yeah, intentionally or otherwise. Uh, and sometimes, um, you know, even the observations and so on might lie to us. Yeah, and so the information we have isn't always complete and accurate. And that's part of our decision making uh, problem that we have. But we need that thorough assessment using an appropriate model and gather relevant information. I think one of the problems in information overload in our current pre-hospital care model is that it encourages us to sometimes gather a lot of information, particularly if you've got your EPCR with you. It wants to know the patient's religious preferences and where they went to school and you know what their favorite biscuit is and that sort of stuff. And we can become overloaded in this information, you know, that actually is not relevant to the patient care at all. And I'm sure somewhere, somewhere, someone uses it for something. I'm not entirely sure they do, but you know, I think um, it, it's very easy to add to that sort of, you know, flow of information and turn the fire hose on more when it's, uh, you know, when we're already struggling with the volume of information we're getting. So about using and interpreting our diagnostic tests. And we've talked about this before in some of our webinars about how we have to a little bit of understanding. Because just putting a pulse oximeter on someone or taking a non-invasive blood pressure isn't really good enough unless you understand just a little bit, not on an anesthetic level where you have to know how everything works. Yeah. Um, but, you know, just a little bit of how those machines work and how they gather data and how they present it to you helps you interpret how accurate it's likely to be. Yeah. And that's one of the problems. Yeah. I'm, I'm put, I've put this monitoring thing on. I don't like the answer. You know, is that because the patient is very sick? Or is it because, you know, the machine is actually wrong because it doesn't like these circumstances? Yeah, so we need to have, you know, just a little bit about idea about how tests work and what values we might see and so on. So using and interpreting diagnostic tests is really, really important. Now, I know in the last webinar, we had a little prize uh, for uh, for someone uh, to, uh, to win and Andy's promised us one again. So the follow-up slide from this one is the prize. It's the first person to type into the chat box what this diagnostic uh, piece of equipment is. Go. And the winner is Scott Gowdy. Yeah, it's entitled CO2. Yeah, well done, Scott. Uh, I'm sure Andy will be listening and message you and uh, and send you a prize yeah so uh, yeah this is n total co2 this is how it works yeah, we've got a little pump that uh, you know um, extracts air from the patient and sends it through a sensor and turns that into a visual representation um you know so uh um just having a little bit of idea about how some of these things work yeah understanding the diagnostics you're using their validity and reliability you just need a little bit of knowledge you don't have to know how it technically works inside the machine. Yeah, you can, you know, live in live in the world where it's done by magic pixies, you know, and uh, and that's fine. Yeah, but you need to know a little bit about what it does and how it works and when it's reliable, when it's not reliable. Because that gives you an idea about the value you place on the information it's telling you. You know, we know you can't take it all at face value. Yeah, you can't um, diagnose a patient by looking at the monitor. Yeah. Um, you know, the monitor, uh, a, a observation is not a diagnostic tool, not a diagnosis, it's a diagnostic tool. 
So it's really, really important we learn a bit. And if you want to do anything, you know, I think I put one in the, one of the last presentations about learn about, you know, uh, how SPO2 works and that sort of type of stuff. So there's plenty of resources out there uh, on the internet. So just get out and learn a little bit about how these things work. And it's amazing how it helps your clinical practice because you then have an idea about, you know, why the test is working, why the test isn't working, et cetera. How do we understand our cognitive biases and human factors? This is a whole talk in itself, isn't it? You know, um, how are we interpreting the data and how are we uh, uh, interpreting that data with our biases, you know, with what we think and, you know, and all the other human factors you know, going on, like confirmation bias and anchoring and all the other things that we talked about. And if you find that sort of fascinating, you know, then sort of uh, head back to uh, one of my previous presentations earlier this year, I think, humans in the ambulance system. So we've got to have an appreciation about how we interact with this situation and all the data based on our opinions, our values, our education, our knowledge, uh, the influence of others in the team, the influence of others at the scene. You know, what are the expectations of bystanders? What's the expectation of the patient and much more? Uh, and we have to accept that we can't make safe appropriate clinical decisions without considering all this non-technical stuff yeah what is influencing us because we are human and we can't uh we can't remove that you can't train people not to be human people have tried yeah you can't train airline pilots not to be human no matter what you do they'll still crash the plane every now and again yeah so you know really important we recognize that as part of the system and uh, refer back to that previous talk uh if that if you find that helpful uh, we also have to accept that uh, we're very much influenced by our own personal and ethical needs. Yeah, a lot of you will recognize this. Sometimes it's a pyramid. I found a nice graphic for it, for Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, uh, you know, and this is what, how, what human beings thrive on, our psychological, physiological needs, our safety needs, love and belonging, esteem, and then the wonderful peaks of self-actualization. Yeah, uh, now we have to accept that uh, at four o'clock in the morning when you're on ambulance night shift you're lucky to crawl out of the basic needs of physiological yeah uh, all you can think about is i'm hungry i'm cold i'd like to be at home in bed yeah uh, and that very much influences the clinical decisions we make because of those sort of you know bad hours when you know you don't really want to be there and you're tired you know and you've not had your meal break and all this sort of stuff that very much influences our practice and we have to recognize that you know that uh you know sometimes that can lead us to not making great decisions and that's because we're you know we're a slave to this sort of uh hierarchy of needs our basic instincts will cut in when we're hungry and all we care about is being hungry and we'll fight someone for a greg sausage roll so you know those things we have to recognize what about our thinking about thinking? Partly our sort of reflection and uh, and how we learn and that sort of type stuff. I think that's really important, isn't it? You know, we're looking at the task in hand. We're evaluating any strengths and weaknesses, you know, uh, that we might have. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and how the task can be done. Yeah. Or what strengths and weaknesses we have in our team. Yeah, what strengths and weaknesses we have in the procedures that are available to us if there's more than one, or the drugs that are available to us if there's more than one. We're going to plan our approach. We're going to apply those strategies and then reflect back. You know, no, not in a true, necessarily at this point, a formal reflection of, well, I'm going to sit and write this up using John's model or something like that. Yeah, obviously, crash model, because that's much better, isn't it, Andy? Um, but... Uh, the, uh, you know, that reflection, uh, you know, might be instantaneous. I've done this to the patient. You know, have they got better or have they got worse? Well, they've got slightly worse. Is that something I've done? No, what I've done should have made them better. Well, I might give them some more of that to see if it makes them better. You know, the fact they've got worse is not relevant to what I've done. It's what we've done hasn't worked yet. Yeah, or do we need to change something and assess the task? This is going on the whole time, isn't it? The whole time we're treating patients. Yeah, we're doing this sort of reflective loop, this metacognition cycle, uh, you know, where we're taking all this information uh, and making very rapid decisions under a lot of pressure. And I think probably at the moment that's getting worse, certainly in the UK, the, you know, shortage of um, experienced registrants within some ambulance services mean, you know, that you know, sometimes where there previously might have been two registrants or, you know, at a complex scene, there might now only be one and a lot more people in a, 
in a different grade role. And so the, you know, more and more of the um, difficult thinking is being placed onto, on, onto less people. I think that's really a challenge that we're going to have. So, yeah, how do we do this reflection in action? Don't make single isolated decisions, but a series of them that change as other factors change or influence them by our actions, i.e. treatments. Yeah, so, you know, this is a constantly spinning cycle where things are changing all the time. Is why our brain is going at a million miles an hour trying to manage our complex things. What about our patient-centered evidence-based medicine? Yeah, what is good for our patient? We've got a lot of materials we can access for that, haven't we? You know, we've got our, um, you know, our reference books. We've got our jail calc guidelines. You know, our jail calc app. You know, we've got the NICE guidelines, we've got our own practice and experience, any educational courses we might have done, what we've learned in other settings. You know, we've got this huge amount of information, basically this massive library about pre hospital care that we're carrying around in our head, or in my case, I think an ever-decreasing library because it seems to be leaking out. I think that's just an age-related thing. Yeah, but our knowledge repository, both individual and as a team, this isn't just my knowledge is that this is the team knowledge everyone that's here at this incident uh, and those supporting us our team knowledge and experience of managing similar cases this experiential reflective learning which certainly for very sick patients is very hard to achieve now uh, you know in anything other than years and years just because of the low volume of these things yeah um we know you know as human beings we learn by making mistakes don't we you know, hopefully we make small mistakes and we don't do that mistake again, you know, because that'd be the true sort of definition of stupidity. Uh, and then we learn some more, we learn some more, we learn some more, we learn some more, and that never ends, does it? You know, so, you know, I think there has over the last few years, we've increased the amount of education in pre-hospital care, particularly for paramedics moving to, you know, three-year BSc program and a lot doing, you know, um, postgraduate education beyond there. There was a time where, I think experience became much maligned. Uh, education became more valued than experience. I don't think either can work in, a, educate, uh, in isolation. You can have a huge amount of experience, but if you don't have the theoretical knowledge to, to, to back your decision-making, then you, know, you can only base it on your knowledge. Uh, and that only means you have to have seen that exact same patient before because you don't have a knowledge bank to call upon to make a different decision than you made last time. But likewise, having a huge amount of theoretical knowledge and no experience in applying that knowledge uh, is equally, um, you know, uh, uh, disadvantageous because you don't know what happens when you apply that knowledge because you've never tried it before. Yeah, and it takes some experimentation. So both knowledge and experience, how to apply the knowledge, are equally as important. I thought I'd just get a topical reference in as I happened to go and watch Oppenheimer, the film, the other night, which I can highly recommend unless you're of a nervous disposition. Uh, and uh, in which case, you might not like it because um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll ruin the film. There's some bombs in it. And, uh, you know, uh, one of the lines that came up in the movie was this, theory can only take you so far. They were quantum physicists, math, you know, mathematicians. Uh, and they you know, cracked the problem of how to make a nuclear explosion. Um, but the theory can only take you so far. Yeah, you have to then experiment with the practice of that theory in order to get to the solution that you want. Our shared decision-making, yeah. How do we share this burden yeah, we've got all this information flowing at us in a really complex scene and different people are gathering different bits of information and that's really hard to share. You know, imagine a out-of-hospital cardiac arrest where you've got the people that were on scene first, you've got people speaking to the relatives, you might have the other agencies there. Um, you know, you're trying to understand the wishes of the patient, the wishes of the relatives, you know, what paperwork's there, their medical history, different people are gathering bits of information, different people are watching different things you know, your team leader hopefully has the oversight of it all. Yeah, but sometimes we struggle to get someone there in that sort of team leader role. So, you know, how can we have a sort of shared decision-making model? Yeah, and there's lots of models out there that describe that. And I think, you know, uh, you can find lots. Uh, you need lots of uh, lots of these bits. Yeah, this active listening, play, paying close attention to what people are saying is really important. 
and some deliberation. A lot of things we have to do are expedient. We sometimes have to do things and make decisions quickly. There's also times we can just stop for a few seconds and think about it and go, okay, let's sort of reset. Is there anything we need to do here? You know, are we doing the best? Has anyone got any other ideas? Yeah, and so, the, you know, this team talk, working together, what are our choices? You know, what's our goal? You know, speaking to the patient, you know, what decision suits you best? Looking at alternatives uh, with the team members, comparing possible options. You know, what matters most to you for this decision for the patient and our decision talk and making preference-based decisions, I think, is all really important. It's really, really difficult to make decisions in isolation. Um, you know, we need to use our colleagues, we need to use the patient if they're in a position to do so. If not, we're acting sort of uh, in a parental role for them and making a sort of um, patient-centered uh, best interest decision for the patient. Um, but sometimes we're, you know, stuck in quite a bit of isolation if we don't have appropriate colleagues. And I think probably even more so nowadays that we have so many flash teams, you know, we have so many uh, ambulance crews that don't work together. I went to a cardiac arrest in the street a few days ago, um, about 15 minutes from home, uh, in, uh, you know, over the border into a different ambulance service. So I don't know anyone I went to because I was probably, you know, um, the closest, um, uh, one of the closest resources. Um, so I don't know anyone on the scene whatsoever. Uh, in fact, the two ambulance crews there from the ambulance service, they didn't know each other because they were from stations 30 miles apart. So they didn't know each other either. And then someone else turned up and no one knew them. Yeah, and that's the that's the really a, a lot of the, the model we work in now where, you know, these sort of flash teams are not, you know, greatly beneficial to this sort of team shared decision-making model. But sometimes we don't share when we can. Yeah, we try and be isolationist. You know, and I'm in charge. I'm going to make the decisions. Yeah, and sometimes there's a place for that, isn't there? It's a place for that sort of authoritarian approach. Yeah, almost um, sort of dictatorship approach at times when things need to be done and expediently. And sometimes a, a more inclusive approach. And it's important to be that listener when needed. Yeah, and uh, you know, because some people are sometimes saying really good things and you don't hear it. You know, sometimes someone says something and you're like, "Oh God, yeah." Yeah, I'm, glad, I'm glad I heard you say that because that's really, really important, you know, and it might just be something little, but it changes everything about that patient. And we need to remember the, you know, the value of active followership, followership as well as leadership. Yeah, we can't all be leaders. Yeah, and if we're working in a team, we should really aspire to being a really good follower, yeah, and being a really good doer and a really good supporter. Yeah, we can't all be the leaders. Yeah, otherwise we sort of uh, uh, end up in this sort of position. Yeah, uh, you know, well-known phrase, uh, well, well uh, pictured. So we should value followership as much as leadership. Yeah, we should be able to say, I was a really good part of that team that had a really good outcome, and I think that's really important that we can do that. And finally, our clinical reasoning. So we've got all this information now, which sounds enormous, doesn't it? This is this is our what we do all the time, every day. Yeah, we gather all this information. And churning around in the middle is our clinical reasoning. What do I think is going on? What am I going to do about it? What decisions are we going to make about this patient? Where are we going to take them to? Are we going to take them anywhere? Where are we going to refer them to, etc.? So, do we need some sort of model for managing that? Yeah, I found this sort of clinical reasoning cycle. Yeah, of uh, you know, um, consider the person in the context. Yeah, so you know, if that's the patient, consider the patient. In the context of the patient, how you're seeing them, why you're seeing them, collect clues and information. And, oh, no, bear with me one second. It's all gone wrong. I pressed the wrong thing. Yeah, collect clues and information. Look at our little cycle here. We'll come to that in a minute. Identify problems and issues. Establish goals. Take action Yeah, or intervene. Evaluate the outcomes. Reflect on the process. What have we learned from it? And go around our loop and this is what we're doing this is our clinical reasoning cycle evaluate assess plan implement now that looks very complex doesn't it not something you might be able to sort of recall if you want to sort of check yourself and so on yeah you know so considering our person and context is important is this a resuscitation or a death because they're two different things aren't they a resuscitation is someone who's dead who should be alive and a death is someone who's dead who, who should be dead because something has happened to them that means they're, they're dead. Collect clues and information, process information, identify problems, establish goals, et cetera. Yeah, what can we learn from that? 
But if we take the small part of that, I think this is more practical. Yeah, I think the, the other one is quite complex. This is more practical. Plan, do, check, act, I think is a, you know, a, a really good thing to consider. Yeah, we're going to plan it. We're going to do it. We're going to be certain. We're going to act and round. Yeah, yeah, plan, perform, look at it, improve it. Yeah, plan, perform, monitor, improve. That's our reflective cycle, isn't it? But one we can use easily in practice. Yeah, and that's a, a simpler one that's going to enable us to gain some bandwidth. But how do we cope with all this? You know, how do we cope with all this information that's coming towards us? Because even after this discussion, I think this is probably the feeling you have. Oh, my God, I didn't realize I was doing this. Yeah, I didn't realize I was, uh, you know, actually doing this in practice, taking all this information and making these super complex decisions. Yeah, and that's why I would say to paramedics, that's why you're at university for three years. Yeah, it's not about intubation or something like that. It's to be able to make these complex decisions. How do I cope? So how do we cope with the information flow? How do we turn our fire hose into a, a hose we can drink from? Yeah. And uh, how can we make this more useful for us in practice? And I think we've got to accept some hard truths. And one of those is the important realization. There's not always one right way. Yeah, when everyone ever tells you, oh, yeah, you should have done it that way. Then don't always think, oh, I should have done it that way. It's like, well, actually, there might be more than one way. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things we teach in some of the trauma courses is this idea of principles and preferences, uh, where the principle is what you want to achieve, but the preference, how you go about it, can almost never be the same because there's so many different factors in the things that we do, the situation, the severity, the scene, the resources we have, the skills we have, you know, uh, the time of day, the weather. There's so many factors that affect what we do that sometimes actually always having the same answer is not the right thing. Yeah, you probably never do many things exactly the same every time. It's always going to be a different factor. So I think that's a really good acceptance to make is that there's not always one right way. Yeah, there might be lots of right ways. There might always be some wrong ways or some sub substandard ways, but we might be forced into those ways because the circumstances mean we're doing the best we can with the resources we have in the circumstance. And that may not be ideal, but it is what we have and we have to deal with. So we'd have to argue there's no always and no never, like we mentioned at the start of the talk. You know, it should be really difficult for someone to say to you in pre-hospital care, you should always do this. Yeah, and you should never do this. Because there's always a time you might do something and always a time you might not do something that would be routine but you'd have clinical justification for that, you know, or practical justification for that based on the circumstances. And everything depends on the circumstances. Yeah, uh, and, and that's why we need a, a broad education and an appreciation of sort of clinical reasoning and gathering that bigger picture and gathering all the information together, you know, and looking at the bigger picture to decide how we can do it. I tried to find some examples of always and never. Yeah, you know, so, you know, top left, we have our sort of standard rigid cervical collar. Now, in my practice, I would never put a rigid cervical collar on anyone uh, based on the fact they have zero evidence. And I'm supposed to be an evidence-based practitioner. Yeah, so, you know, um, you know, I'd never put one on anyone. But the one bottom right, yeah, this sort of semi-flexible, adjustable collar is used by a lot of our helicopter SAR colleagues. Because if you want to winch someone off the side of a boat, you know, then you can't do it with, you know, a scoop and head blocks and straps. Uh, and if the patient's unconscious, you don't want their head flopping all over the place. So apparently that's bad. Yeah, so they carry these sort of single-use bendy collars as more of a head control device, and then they'll be removed shortly after. So if I was to say I would never put a collar on someone, then that would probably be wrong. Yeah, because there are circumstances where it might be a useful device. Yeah, but in the right circumstances for the right thing. Yeah, um, uh, um, but probably not for just plain spine and immobilization because we know for them it probably doesn't do anything. Yeah, so that'd be a, you know, never always a never. Uh, and what about always and always? 
Yeah, and I think it's fairly certain that for uh, ambulance crews, you know, uh, and most pre-hospital care practitioners, they would, you know, almost without fail take the patient's blood pressure. I can't remember the last patient I saw that hadn't had their blood pressure taken. Yeah, but if you go to a GP surgery complaining about your knee pain, not only will they not do lots of observations on you, you'll probably not even take your pulse or anything. Yeah, um, but they'll look at your knee because you've complained your knee hurts. So that's what you've gone in with. That's what they'll look at. Yeah, so if someone's just got an isolated injury, you know, someone's, you know, bang their hand and they've got a, a hurty wrist. Yeah, and that's their entire complaint. And they don't have any other medical history or whatever. You know, why would we always check their blood pressure? Yeah, and you say, wow, we might find something. Well, you know, you might fly to the moon. Yeah, uh, and, and likewise, it's not a benign thing. Yeah, if you imagine an ambulance service that's got two or 300 resources, and then you add up how long it takes to do a blood pressure on every single patient that doesn't need it, and then add up how much time that takes up every single day, and then how many hours are taken up taking unnecessary blood pressures, and how much that costs. Not a benign thing. Yeah, so should we always take a blood pressure on everyone? Yeah, that's a, you know, or any other observation for that matter. Yeah, should there always be an always? Yeah, is there not a reason why you wouldn't do something? Yeah, so I think it's important to recognize that. So overall, in summary, yeah, there should be no always and no never. We work in a very complex world where we have to gather masses of information and use that information in impossibly difficult circumstances, particularly if you're a relatively new, you know, um, inexperienced band five clinician. I can't think of anywhere else in healthcare where a band five clinician would be a autonomous uh, ALS provider uh, other than in paramedics yeah, out on their own, uh, commonly nowadays with a ECA, ECSW, EMT1, whatever flavor they are in your region, that started yesterday um, and, you know, and, and left to make such complex decisions, you know, that, uh, that no one else probably would do without a huge amount more diagnostics uh, and more information about the patient. So thank you for your time this evening. I uh, hope you found this talk useful uh, and, and just stir some ideas uh, about uh, how we think, because I think that's a big part of, advancing our practice and moving into higher levels of practice is thinking about thinking how do we make decisions it's not just information gathering 